Well, good, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. I'm Susan Elliott, the president of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy. And I'm very pleased to be here today to discuss the current situation in the Western Balkans. Um, this initiative is a collaborative effort um, with the National Committee on American Foreign Policy, which I represent, the Nizami Gajabi International Center, and the Foundation Shared Societies and Values Sarajevo. Um, all three of our organizations have been working together uh, on this issue among many others. And we thought today would be a good time to bring together experts from the US and from the region to discuss the current state of play. You know, in 2018, the National Committee on American Foreign Policy published an analytical report and a set of policy recommendations for the future of US policy in the Western Balkans. And we're very pleased that Ambassador Frank Wisner, who participated in um, that report, is here with us today. But we also, in 2019, brought many of the participants together in New York for a private roundtable dis discussion. And from that, we have been in conversation over the past few months. Obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic has slowed down some of what we could do because we had hoped perhaps to meet together in New York on the margins of the UN General Assembly. So we are meeting on the margins of the UN General Assembly, but we're just doing it virtually. Um, and so some of the prescriptions that we laid out in our report have come to pass, but many continue to require careful attention from policymakers, both in the US, Europe, and the region. Um, and I want to particularly note uh, a recommendation from the report, which you can find if you go to our website at ncafp.org. But one of the recommendation was really imploring key officials from both sides of the Atlantic to clarify and coordinate their efforts more closely mm -hmm. to integrate the Western Balkans into European transatlantic political, economic, and security institutions. So as I mentioned, you know, because of the deepened uncertainty created by the COVID-19 pandemic, our organizations you know, have been in discussion and we believe this is an important moment to re-examine and assess the path forward for the region. So as I mentioned, we have been very fortunate to gather a great group of experts here today who will share not only their insights, but their thoughts uh, for the future. And the way we will conduct the discussion is, First, we'll go around and ask each participant to give us an assessment of where they think the region is today, the current situation, and share those ideas among ourselves. And then we'll ask each participant to give us policy recommendations um, based on what they've heard and, um, and where they will uh, be able to go next. And we do have some other participants who, uh, again, if, um, some of those who are online, if you want to ask a question, you can either raise your hand and I'll acknowledge you, or uh, I believe, uh, Rough Sean, that if we can, people can put uh, questions in the Q&A or the chat box, am I right? Um, I think you're on mute, but anyway, if that's okay, we will. So, um, chat, yeah. and, uh, later I will share it immediately with you. Yeah. So let's first start by introducing uh, our distinguished panel of participants. And I'm going to start with, um, because I'm looking around uh, the screen, and I'm going to start with Frank Wisner, Ambassador Frank Wisner. He is a distinguished, has had a distinguished diplomatic career, serving as U.S. Ambassador to, wow, quite a few countries, India, Zambia, Egypt, and the Philippines. So you can see he really has a good idea of, all of the situation around the world. But he also served as Under Secretary of Defense for Policy and Under Secretary of State for International Security Affairs, and is very much uh, interested in what's going on in the region. We also have President uh, Josipovic, um, who served as President of Croatia from 2010 to 2015. And as a politician, he promoted reconciliation in Southeastern Europe, human rights, and the fight against corruption. Before he was president, he served as a university professor teaching international criminal law and criminal procedure. And he was a member of parliament and is also a member of the World Academy of Arts and Sciences. So welcome, Mr. President. 
We Thank also, you. Uh, we also have President uh, uh, Nishani. And President Nishani served as President of Albania from 2012 to 2017. Before he was president, he also served in a number of government and diplomatic positions, including Minister of Justice in Albania and Minister of the Interior. And I'm very pleased to, to also welcome President Boris uh, Tajic. And President Tajic served as President of the Republic of Serbia and uh, from 2004 to 2012. But he also served his country as a member of parliament, deputy speaker of parliament, and a parliamentary group leader, minister of telecommunications and minister of defense. Wow, that's a, an, an impressive portfolio. Um, and um, last but not least, we have uh, Prime Minister uh, Lagum Zija, uh, sorry Zlatko if I, I never get your last name right, but he served also an impressive career uh, for the government of Bosnia and Herzegovina as Prime Minister, Acting Prime Minister, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Member of Parliament, and leader of the largest multi-ethnic political party. And in some of those, uh, he served more than once. So thank you, Zlatko, for your service and also for your membership and support of this event. And I'd also like to mention uh, the brains behind the organization, uh, Mr. Ravshan Muradov, uh, who is the founding secretary general of the Nizami Ganjavi International Center. Um, this is for those of you who are participating who maybe don't know, it's a leading international cultural organization, which is based in Baku, Azerbaijan. The center turned into a global has turned into a global platform for learning, and it is an acknowledged leader in international dialogue on tolerance, understanding, and shared societies over the past three years. So it's an honor for me as the president of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy um, to moderate this, um, what I know will be a fantastic discussion. And what I'm going to do is, um, since um, I'm in New York and, um, and Ambassador Wisner um, was participated in the initial report that the NCAFP did, I'd like to start out with him in the discussion and then we'll go around the table and, um, and hopefully if you have a question or if you want to make a comment on one of the things that your colleagues have said, you can put up two fingers or you can wave at me and, and I'll uh, call on you. And I would ask because I know we have limited time this morning, but if everyone can try to keep their remarks to five minutes and I'll, if you seem to be going over, I'll gently remind you it's time for us to move to the next speaker. So um, Ambassador Wisner, we'll start with you. Thank you, <laughs> Ambassador Elliot. Susan, uh, I want to say thank you to all the sponsors on behalf of your very distinguished panel, and uh, particularly to you for your tireless efforts in making this event possible. I, I come to the table without the expertise, knowledge, and background in the region that so many of you had, including my friend and former sparring partner, Boris Tadic. But I am prepared to claim that I have an unshakable belief in the importance of this region, importance of this region to Europe and to the United States. And I remain and have and will always be committed to the principle of the vision of a Europe whole free and at peace. The Western Balkans is very much part of that region. So if I start and take a quick look at where we stand in 2020, I regret to say that I believe the balance sheet is not positive. While there have been a number of positive events since 2018 when we authored the report you referred to, Susan, um, <clears throat> Macedonia has taken a huge, huge step forward in resolving the name issue and moving on towards NATO and <clears throat> the EU. Um, fears of Islamic terrorism which were much more extant in 2018 have receded. Um, and we haven't seen any of the terrible recurrence of violence that marred the last decade of the last century. But having said that, the core weaknesses of the states of the Western Balkans persist. 
uh, weak governance, uh, stagnant economies, unresolved tensions between ethnicities and nationalities, corruption, criminality continues to be widespread. COVID-19 has wreaked its own damage on the region economically, um, denying a flow of remittances from workers abroad. Um, and finally, Russia. Russia continues to roil the region's waters uh, in an attempt to drive wedges between the Western Balkan nations and those uh, states who have a European vision. So as I look at the region today, I regret uh, that Bosnia remains a badly broken polity. Serbia and Kosovo have not really advanced their relationship beyond a discussion of economic cooperation um, despite recent European and American efforts. Um, but to me, the saddest development over these recent years is the continuing flight of young, young people from the region to Europe and beyond, depriving the area of much needed skills and making the chances of economic recovery more problematical. I also regret as I look back on it that um, the European Union has not been able to accelerate the formal integration of the states of the region. And <clears throat> to my enormous unhappiness, the United States and the EU have lost their way with each other instead of the cooperative relationship we've enjoyed in the past. That's partly our responsibility in Washington as we play politics on the eve of a national election. And it's also in part due to the fact that the United States under this administration has lost the <clears throat> edge of its view that Europe and the United States are vital partners in the maintenance of the good order of the world. So I regret to say that the Western Balkans does not get the time and attention of top leaders on a sustained basis that I would like to see. Susan, this leaves the region uh, in need of attention, in need of recognition uh, and paths forward. We will take that subject up with specific ideas in the second cycle of your questions. So I'll come back to you. Thank you. Susan, if you are yeah, I better take my mute off if I, um, uh, well, I want to thank you, Ambassador Wisner, because I think uh, at least you have perfectly outlined um, the importance of why I, as an American, uh, think that this discussion is important, because no matter what the outcome of our upcoming election, I hope that this group will be able to call attention to what you have just um, very eloquently outlined, is that the U.S. and the European Union and other countries of Europe need to be engaged and pay attention um, to what's going on in, um, in this area of Europe. So I'm going to go next to uh, President Yosipovich, and I'm doing this in kind of an alphabetical order. There's no um, rhyme or reason to the way I've done this. But anyway, uh, President Yosipovich, the flo floor is yours. Uh, President Yosipovich, you need to unmute. Mr. President, you're muted. There you go. Can you hear? Can you hear me now? Yes, perfectly. Please. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I will continue in the same mood as Frank did. So I'm very disappointed uh, by situation in Western Balkans because I consider situation is worse than 10 years ago. Uh, when we see what's going on, we have, uh, for me, two crucial issues. One of them is relation between uh, Serbia and Kosovo. And second is uh, internal uh, issues in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Unfortunately, both of you, those two crucial issues are remaining unresolved. Resolved. Firstly, just recently we had the negotiations in Washington. Uh, President Trump called uh, President of Serbia and Prime Minister of Kosovo 
uh, it was very promoted by media. And uh, if we analyze what is the result, the result is big zero, nothing. Why nothing? Because uh, they agreed on some economical issue. They were agreed uh, even previously. Secondly, uh, they offered something, some compromise uh, without any um, moves, uh, substantial moves in their position because Serbia, uh, President Vucic said that uh, Serbia will not uh, take any action to recall uh, recognition of Kosovo from third parties, but it is uh, exhausted. Uh, Serbia cannot wide this, this, uh, this movement. And Kosovo uh, promised that uh, Kosovo will not uh, ask for membership in different international organizations, uh, also without any practical results, because they already reached what was reachable to them in, in this uh, period. And the uh, third group of issues was is, uh, American interest not connected with the relations uh, with Serbia and Kosovo at all. Matter of Israel or whatever, there are some economical interests of United States engaged in, but uh, it was meeting with the, without any substantial result. So what does it show? It shows that United States and the European Union as well uh, do not have any real idea what to do to resolve, to help to uh, resolve issues between uh, Serbia and Kosovo, unfortunately. Uh, the second important issue or consequence of this meeting is that it's now completely clear that there is no real will from both sides to make compromise. Compromise uh, as a word does not exist in their languages. So um, I'm very worried that a uh, relation, key issue, this relation between Kosovo and Serbia will not be um, uh, resolved because no will, not a, no idea, and no uh, really plan what to do. Now I read just recently that European Union is preparing some economical motivation for uh, changement uh, on the Western Balkans that will not take any result. Uh, now we have this experience for many years, promising of membership uh, to Euro European Union are not enough to motivate uh, or local politicians to change their attitude. Uh, it's also visible in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, so many years after the war, uh, political leaders of three uh, biggest or three most important uh, ethnical groups cannot agree on anything in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, promising European future is without results, economical help as well. Uh, so uh, no idea, no really idea from Europe, no idea from United States. And my thesis is that no one can resolve it if people and politicians in Bosnia and Herzegovina, in Serbia, in Kosovo are not willing to do this. No way how to do it. So uh, United States and Europe should find some other attitudes, another mode how to motivate or to move relations in Bosnia and Herzegovina and relations between, uh, between Serbia and Kosovo. Of course, now uh, we have also issue in, in Montenegro, permanent issue in Macedonia being now much better after the, the, the agreement between uh, Northern Macedonia and Kosovo. Uh, but uh, finally, I will conclude this uh, uh, opening remark by my thesis that there is really important uh, danger that chessboard being now located in Middle East when big powers are playing their chess game can be easily moved to the Western Balkans uh, causing uh, further instability, and uh, uh, I think that even conflict is not excluded. Well, thank you, Mr. President, for your um, your uh, assessment, which I think is very realistic, and I do agree with you that um, no matter what the U.S. and the European Union and other countries of the world do, it really depends on the people. 
of the countries involved to have the will to be able to, um, to resolve their differences. And I was um, a little encouraged that President Trump did have this meeting in the White House. I think it's better than no meeting at all, although I agree with you that, um, that we need to come up with better, you know, substantive recommendations and solutions for uh, the people of the region. So thank you very, very much. And now we will go to uh, President Tajic, um, who is former president of Serbia. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Elliot. Uh, what can I say after uh, Mr. Wiesner and Ivo Josipovic is that uh, I agree with uh, some uh, remarks and uh, definitions of our situation, which is uh, looking uh, not that good. After 10 years of our joint efforts to stabilize the region and to bring peace and reconciliation in the region. Uh, some countries, uh, even my country and the current government is, uh, is very much uh, uh, proud of uh, bringing more weapon in our military system, in our defense sector, and uh, some other countries are reacting on that. And uh, maybe this is the reason why my friend Ivo Josipovic is uh, even mentioning that possible conflict is uh, something that we have to take into account. I would like to avoid that scenario, and this is the, my first reaction, uh, what United States can do. United States and the current administration can work on uh, uh, calming down situation and not supporting people that are bringing more tensions in the region. Uh, many people expected that uh, dialogue in Washington is going to bring uh, new added value in terms of relations between Belgrade, Pristina, Serbia and Kosovo. But uh, I fully agree with the uh, uh, definition of which was made by uh, Ivo Josipovic that that uh, meeting brought uh, nothing in our relations and all that meeting was more focused on uh, presidential elections in the United States than uh, working on uh, decreasing tensions between uh, Serbs and Albanians in the region. I mean, uh, if we, I'm adding to that the fact that uh, that meeting uh, uh, pointed out the conclusion about removing embassy from Jerusalem, from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, uh, which was uh, on, the, on the top of agenda of uh, President Trump uh, during election campaign, and also uh, considering Hezbollah as a, as a terrorist organization, and uh, finally, our common efforts in fighting uh, uh, discrimination of homosexuality in some countries like Sudan. I think that uh, that facts are bringing to us crystal clear uh, picture that uh, those that meeting was more focused on presidential campaign in the United States and chronic problem we affected all together for almost decades. And this is why uh, I'm not that optimistic uh, after that meeting in Washington. And this is why I'm suggesting to you to take into the consideration possible totally different approach of United States in our situation on the Western Balkans in the future. Many things are going to be very much depend on results of presidential elections in, in, in United States. And we are waiting what is going to be uh, final result and outcome of that elections, but also we are looking for uh, some uh, systematic reaction of European Union because all countries are uh, declaring in the region that they, they would like to become a member states of European Union. But Europe is uh, not uh, looking that uh, uh, really confident in terms of creating policy on the Western Balkans. And I'm afraid I have concern that the European Union is now they only following and they're reacting on uh, the first steps that are made by administration of Donald Trump. Uh, Mr. Wiesner, with the, his huge experience, have mentioned that uh, we have to take into account the influence of Russia and China in the region nowadays in the Western Balkans. But I would like to add also huge influence of Turkey 
which is a growing, uh, specifically in some circles in Bosnia, Montenegro, and Serbia and Macedonia. Also, specific influence of Iran. Now, because of uh, we, had, we we took over uh, definition about Hezbollah like is a terrorist organization. We are going to be uh, the, the countries, I mean, I'm talking about Kosovo and Serbia under uh, kind of surveillance from Iran in the future. And uh, finally, Israel. Israel uh, is, a, uh, is a taking a very specific role in, in the Balkans after meeting in Washington because of uh, their decision about embassy in Jerusalem. Uh, I mean, Immediately after meeting in Washington, when Serbia and Kosovo accepted to uh, remove embassies from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, European Union uh, reacted by saying uh, to the officials that uh, uh, if Serbia or Kosovo are going to take over really their decision in the future, uh, we are going to be in a very uh, specific situation regarding future membership in the European Union because European Union is uh, not accepting that uh, decision uh, nowadays. Uh, I'm mentioning that because of trying to uh, explain to you how complicated the situation in the Western Balkans is, how complicated the situation is because of uh, conflict of interest of the big powers, United States, Russia, China, and if you are adding to that interest of the very significant countries for regional policy and regional politics like Turkey, Iran, and Israel, uh, that situation is uh, looking even more and more complicated than 10 years ago. This is why I'm sharing that kind of concerns that uh, Ivo Yosipovic has had explained to you, and uh, I, I really worry about situation. I can say something uh, which, which, which is looking more optimistic nowadays, even though reaction of my friends from the region regarding elections in Montenegro, firstly, was very, very um, negative. But I think that changing of uh, current uh, ruling party on the power, uh, the party of uh, Mr. Djokanovic can bring some uh, positive effect in, uh, in the regional countries. You know that we are living in the countries where autocrats are uh, on the power very often. I mean, this is Serbia, this is uh, Montenegro, this is Hungary, this is Poland, this is Turkey. I, I, maybe I can mention even some big powers uh, regarding regarding uh, that that problem. But uh, this is uh, such a mood in the, in the international uh, arena. But uh, I, I'm, I'm worried about my region and my country. But. After third, three decades, we have a replacing from the power Democratic Party of Socialists led by Mr. Djukanovic in Montenegro. After three decades, uh, you have to take into consideration the fact that that uh, party is a kind of continuation after Communist Party, which means we had a, almost after Second World War, same party on the power only in Montenegro. Nowadays, we have a new situation. Many people have, have been explaining their concerns about uh, effects uh, of, uh, resu of results in Montenegro, but I'm right now pretty sure that can be much better than uh, many of that of my friends explained uh, firstly as a reaction uh, after uh, after getting results from Montenegrin elections, I'm talking with the, with the people from Montenegro. I'm talking with the representatives of three coalitions that are going to form a government. I talked with uh, uh, Mr. Krivokapic, who is very new in politics, even though he's my age and the age of Ivo Josipovic. I talked with the people with the Mr. Bercic and Mr. Uh, Lekic, and also with the people that are surrounding Dritan uh, Abazovic. And I'm pretty sure that they are going to continue foreign policy agenda about NATO membership, foreign policy agenda about European Union membership, and uh, in terms of cooperation and reconciliation in the region. And I'm asking you to help them right now. Uh, spe specifically, it's a very important reaction of United States right now. I'm very happy because of the reaction of ambassador of United States yesterday. Uh, which supported a uh, new government and uh, explaining that the United States are going to be happy because of cooperation with the new coalition on the power. 
And this is also very important. Even though Montenegro is a very small country, but uh, because of having very significant influence regarding other autocracy in the region we are facing with. Thank you. Well, thank you, President Tajic. I think you have raised some really important issues about the importance of uh, one, uh, supporting the new government in Montenegro and working uh, together, but also the importance of looking at how complex the situation is in the region. And it's not just, again, the, the, the countries that are uh, dealing with the issues among themselves, but the influence of not just European Union, United States, but China, Russia, um, Iran, Turkey, and, and beyond. So it is, um, I almost will say it's a crossroads. It's an area, you know, on the southeastern portion of Europe that is a gateway to, to the Middle East and to Asia. And uh, I think it's extremely important that um, we be engaged. And I also uh, like that you brought up uh, NATO. We've mentioned the European Union, but you know some of the countries now are members of NATO. NATO has played, I think, a key role um, with the K4 um, in uh, trying to keep peace uh, between Kosovo and uh, Serbia. And, uh, and I think these are all um, issues in my opinion, no matter again, who wins uh, the election in the United States, uh, this is a really crucial time for us to bring these issues um, to the forefront. And, um, and even if uh, Vice President Biden wins, he's going to have so many things to deal with that you know, these issues may not come to his desk on January 20th. So I think we as a group need to uh, work together to make sure that that all um, the issues are kept in the forefront. And, and I would agree also that the European Union has not focused on this. And part of it is because of Brexit and the issues that they have had to deal with among themselves. So um, on that bright note, I want to turn to Prime Minister uh, Lagumje uh, to give us his thoughts and, and also to thank him because he is one of the driving forces behind keeping us together and, uh, and making sure that we um, have a great discussion uh, on the region. So, Zlatko, please go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much. I want to thank you and I want to thank Roshan, of course, for this uh, big generator behind this uh, this uh, network of brains that are put together under the umbrella of NCFP. Of course, uh, I mean, you are you're not only moderating, you are giving us very clear guidelines and uh, giving really uh, introductory remarks about directions that we probably want to go uh, and open some issues. Of course, uh, Frank, I think you, 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 you really uh, uh, made a great opening and uh, reminding us of your paper of your paper that was titled Time for Action in Western Balkans. I think that your paper, uh, uh, now we need some, maybe now today it would be, let's say, uh, retitled by Time for Race, Race Against Time for Action in Western Balkan. And not for any action, but for right action. Right now we have action, but not right action in the Balkan. We have uh, wrong actions inside the Western Balkan in some countries, and we have no action of the stakeholders especially Euro-Atlantic stakeholders that are looking at this as uh, stability. They don't shoot each other. There is no shooting. And uh, we, are not, we are no CNN-able no more. So let's forget about that. And I hope we will not become CNN-able. I mean, that's, that's for sure. Uh, that's my real hope. Because I was once a guinea pig that survived the CNN-able experiment. And it was very painful. But what I'm trying to say is I will just uh, pick up some uh, in identifying issues. I will just uh, rephrase some of the things that uh, still hold from your report. Uh, one of the first, first issues that we are witness we are facing right now is poor governance and weak institutions in all of countries of Western Balkan. Uh, and the bad economy is just reflection of that. As a matter of fact, I think that economy in Bosnia and Herzegovina is significantly better shaped then institutions and overall political framework and rule of law is uh, letting them to be so. So our economy is more, uh, let's say, strong than it would be expected to be under such a circumstance. I think it applies to a lot of parts of this region. Second issue that I think is uh, uh, 
a very important one is uh, regional relations between Western Balkan states. Uh, what I'm saying by that is, uh, I think the main problem remains that we have not buried the ghosts from the past. We are still from time to time pulling all ghosts from the past. And instead of uh, going to European Union based on the European values of unity and diversity, based on the shared societies approach, based on uh, appreciating others' identities, based on the fact that we should live together, we are going back to the 90s, where basically speaking, uh, we were in a war because some people thought that everything will be sorted out when we divide ourselves along different ethnic lines. So uh, I think that and I completely agree with uh, my dear friend Ivo, who was saying that uh, one of the two problems, first problem, of course, is uh, Krishna and Kosovo, or it can be second, but another one is Bosnia. But he was saying that internal issues in Bosnia are the biggest problem. I would say that Bosnia is the second biggest problem, A, internal issues, and B, issues that are dealing with Bosnia from outside forces. Why I'm saying this is, I think it is very important to understand, I think, uh, I'll give you just example. While we are talking right now, we have some Copernican shift in, in Zagreb policy that right now Milorad Dodik was accepted at this very moment. He's meeting Prime Minister and President of the Republic of Croatia on an official state visit, even being the member of the presidency. And mm -hmm. as he was explained by, by the press uh, of uh, President Prime Minister of Croatia, he's not there as a member of the presidency, but he's there as the leader of Bosnian Serbs. This is mm -hmm. absolutely wrong approach to, 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 let's say, to sorting out the problems in region by identifying who is the uh, leader of certain ethnicity. When Boris was president of Serbia, he was not president of Serbs. When he was president of Croatia, he was not president. When I was prime minister in my country, I did not ever accept to be prime minister on behalf of ethnic group or leader of the group which I belonged to, even when I was the strongest political party in that group. And I think that we cannot talk about European Union and getting along those standards. And one of the big, biggest challenges for us is to just flip the coin, get out of the old, old uh, stereotypes, get out of the old formulas, get out of old reference manuals, uh, because we cannot sort out these problems by actually dividing people again along ethnic and religion lines. And the third one is, of course, issue, third big issue is playground for ambitions of uh, international forces that now see that through Western Balkan, they can destabilize a uh, broader region and maybe come bring us into the thinking that in the 10 years from now, Western Balkan and European Union are going to look the same, but we don't know who's going to look like whom. Are we going to be like European Union or European is going to look like Western Balkan? So I think that that is very important to understand that there are internal, external forces who are interested in actually making us being equal like European Union, but being us all Western Balkan. So, and, uh, and last point, which I think I'm very mm -hmm. thankful, Frank, that you mentioned it, as, uh, as you said, uh, brain drain. I think that's one of the biggest problems in the region. One of the biggest issues in the region is brain drain. I'll give you an example, Frank. This morning, we have statistics mm -hmm. that in Bosnia and Herzegovina, this year, 5% less kids were enrolled mm -hmm. in the first grade of elementary school than last year. 5% less. Not because they were less born, but most of them left with their parents as babies instead mm -hmm. of going to school in here. So brain drain is one of the biggest problems. Mm -hmm. And the brain drain is here uh, the consequence of exactly the things that we're talking about. Uh, lack of hope because there is no trust in the state. And because of the fact that I'll talk about the second term a little bit about it, I think that we are having leadership in the region. I'm not talking even about Croatia, I'm talking about Western Balkan. I mean, because you are expert for us, because you were us, and you still are us, mindset speaking, I mean, in positive sense of the thinking. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that we have in a majority of the countries in Western Balkan, complete disconnection between leadership and constituency in variety of ways. I'll give you some data later on, based on, uh, on a study that was done by International Republican Institute about the region perception of what the people think about where we are going as a region. And you can see complete disconnection between leadership and, and people who are on the ground. And that's where we come to the brain drain issue again and again. The lack of hope for the young people. So we have to provide them some kind of assurance that 
this is a process that is going in the right direction. At this moment, it doesn't look like it is going in the right direction. So, and last point from this, uh, two things I learned from 90s, Boris is also familiar with it. I learned something from Ante Markovic, last prime minister of Yugoslavia, who was Croat, and uh, from Milosic, who was the guy who locked the, turned the light off. Uh, Milosic did not give up the territory and did not give up ideology. He wanted more territory and ideology to be remaining on his territory with people who are his ethnic group. Instead of trying to reorganize Yugoslavia politically in order to keep Yugoslavia in politically way, in a way that all people, all ethnic groups, all are. You know, so instead of content of the country, he chose the territory to be bigger. That's if tomorrow, today someone wants to extend the territory on the expense of other countries, it's completely wrong way. And second one is Ante Markovic, who was excellent, excellent reform economist as economy, but he was saying that one of his, let's say, wrong perceptions, he said that we should not worry about Yugoslavia because economy is good. We have stable currency, stable economy. My point is we have to go for economy, but economy is not going to sort out our problems. So economy is not everything, but without economy, nothing is possible. And my point is very simple. We have to think about economy, but don't think that economy is going to sort out our problems. Our problems are the problems related with the European values of shared societies versus old 19th century values of segregated societies along ethnic and religious lines. And with all due respect, Ivo, uh, if Bosnia and Herzegovina, you are the president who together with Yadran Kakosa, who are coming from two different political parties, you actually pulled through the Croatian parliament one of the historic declaration about cooperation between Bosnia and Herzegovina and Croatia as a two states, as Croatia helping us as a state to get closer into Europe, European Union and NATO. And I think today the declaration is challenged. I salute you for that declaration. I hope that it is not doing, we will not witness Bosnian Serbs, Bosnian Muslims, Bosnian Croats representatives visiting surrounding countries instead of being there as a statesman who represent this country and people of this country because we want to be, we, the people. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Divo. Yeah, uh, in principle, I agree, Zlatko, with you, but I'm, I have to underline, uh, troublemakers in Bosnia and Herzegovina are not Croatia and Serbia, sorry, sorry. Uh, you cannot reach basic agreement on your internal relations. I was asked today uh, to comment. Mm. I didn't know that, that Mr. Dodik, Dodik is coming to Croatia. I had hundreds of meetings separately as friends with Mr. Izetbegovic, with Mr. Chovic, even with Mr. Dodik. What is the problem? Internal problem is Bosnia and Herzegovina is not born in Croatia, not in Serbia, not in the United States, not in Brussels. It's your problem, and you can resolve it just you, no one else. No one else. And unfortunately, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, I cannot recognize single very responsible politician who is really willing to resolve the problem. Everything in Bosnia and, Cro in Bosnia and Herzegovina is either Croatian, Serbian, or Bosnia. I cannot recognize even football team is not common one. So uh, it's not wise policy to switch responsibility for Bosnia and Herzegovina to someone else. Relations between Mr. Dodik and the other members of the presidency is your internal problem, not of Croatian president of Croatian prime minister. So you have to find, uh, find the force inside you to resolve this very complicated, very sensitive and, uh, issue. And uh, you correctly mentioned Croatia, all Croatian governments, really all Croatian governments after Tujman, after Tujman, uh, uh, considered Bosnia and Herzegovina as a completely independent state, trying, trying to help you to enter European Union and NATO. Where was the resistance? Not in Croatia, not in Serbia, not in uh, Brussels, in Bosnia and Herzegovina itself. And that's a basic problem because Bosnia and Herzegovina does not have internal strongness, internal force to be really unified state willing, willing 
to enter European Union and NATO. If I can just clarify shortly, Ivo, I mean, you are absolutely right that uh, we have to find internal force in Bosnia. You're absolutely right when you're saying that you don't see the strong forces in here who can be credibly representing everyone. I'm not yeah. doubting that. And I said that two issues. First one is the one that I agree with you, that we have to sort out our internal problems and we have to do it ourselves. No one outside of us is going to Definitely. sort it out. That's point number one, but there's point number two as well. I mean, point number two is what I'm saying is that if you, someone from outside is coming here to help us, please help us to be one state, help us if you are coming from European Union, try to help us on European Union values. Try to help us to get stronger, become stronger state with all ethnic, religious, and individual rights being pres preserved for everyone. So do not please help us by dividing us in ethnic or religious camps. That's my- But you problem. are doing that, not but, but, but from are, the other it's, side. It's, it's your internal it's, problem. You are right, we are doing it, but don't, don't push us because there are us as well who don't want to be three tribes in this part of the world. So don't put us in three tribal envelopes. Because, of course, Dodik is going willingly. I'm not saying that they are Bosniak, they are Croat and Serb leaders who want to be leaders of their ethnic group exclusively. But I'm, I think it's a wrong approach. I you, agree with you. You no, know what I did no, as a president. You know what I did as a president. I came no, to Bosnia and Herzegovina. I no, had speech in the parliament. I visited mass graves of Bosniaks killed by Croats. I visited mass graves of Serbs, mass graves of Croats together with your politician from all the ethnicity and religious leaders. Yeah, so that was my policy. But unfortunately, no one wanted to follow that policy. No one in Bosnia had to go in. But not only in Bosnia, in Croatia and Serbia as well, because yesterday we had the first time day of Serbian unity as official, uh, official holiday of Republika Srpska and Serbia where Dodik publicly said that he wants to unite Republika Srpska and Serbia in one state. And day after that, he's going as the leader of Bosnia Serbs in Zagreb to meet with your president, prime minister. That doesn't make sense either. Oh, no. no, I think you both uh, have the same, uh, at least from my perspective uh, as a very interested American, that you're both seeing the same things. I think, Zlatko, I agree with you that the presidents of the countries need to be a representative of all the ethnic groups. And so that if I'm the president of Bosnia and Herzegovina, that I represent everyone. And I don't just represent the Bosniaks or, or the Serbs. And I think this is something that every country of the world has to depend on that whether you're the president of Germany or the president of the United States, Thank that you, you represent all the people. This is a very difficult issue for especially uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina because you have so many ethnic groups. But I would agree with Zlatko that the outside forces um, sometimes are not trying to unify, but they are trying to divide. And I think Bosnia is particularly um, susceptible to this uh, uh, kind of outside influence that is seeking to divide rather than, than unify. And there are many examples of that, especially when we look at some of the countries that we discuss as influencers. Instead of trying to bring Serbs and Bosniaks together to bring different religious groups together, they're looking to uh, divide. And, uh, and that, I think, is a, a problem, not just with Bosnia and Herzegovina, with all uh, countries of the region. But I'd also like to pick up on something that Frank and Zlatko said, and that is the, you know, the brain drain. I think what I've seen from other countries of uh, former Warsaw Pact uh, and Eastern Europe is when you join the European Union, it's a double-edged sword. Um, it provides you with a lot of advantages you know, for your economy, but it also gives young people the advantage of being able to go to other places in Europe and to, um, and to look for jobs elsewhere. So I do think that Zlatko is right. We need to look for ways to provide opportunities uh, economically and politically in all the countries to make sure that, you know, that young people who are talented want, you know, to stay uh, in the region. So, uh, and stay in, in their countries. Uh, and I just want to, um, before we move to the next round, because uh, we're doing pretty well on time, but are there any of our invited guests who have questions 
uh, based on what they've heard from you know our speakers uh, before we move to maybe talking about uh, policy recommendations. Uh, I think, um, and I may be wrong, so I ask this to Rob Sean, um, for those of you who we can see on the screen, especially our board members from National Committee and our invited guests, we can unmute you and you can ask your question um, rather than have to type it. Um, but is anyone have any uh, questions they'd like to ask? I see um, uh, Richard Howe. Um, I, I, I wanted to make a comment here. It seems to me that from everything that's been said so far, the thing that's really absent uh, at, 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 at the, in the Western Balkans is disinterested American leadership in foreign policy. Uh, this meeting at the White House, although I'm glad to see that there was a meeting, it seems to me it was focused on domestic politics and not on, on, not on trying to solve the, the attitude, the way Richard Holbrook would have approached it or some of the other leaders we've had in the past. And what we need is, is American leadership because that's what will bring the Europeans in, is, is if, we have, if we have an American leader who's willing to go over there and say, and say you guys have to get together and, 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 and uh, work this out uh, and, and, and just bring people around the table uh, like we've done in so many other situations around the world. But right now, uh, our leaders in Washington are only focused on America first and whatever is helping the election campaign. And I think that, you know, that's what seems to have been the focus of this particular meeting. I don't think that the Biden administration, if Biden is, wins the election, and I know that's where the polls are pointing right now, but a lot could change between now and the election. But uh, if, if I don't think the Biden campaign is going to base foreign policy on domestic political considerations. I think that Biden had a, had a worldview that was based on international diplomacy. And I also think that the State Department has been hollowed out uh, by simply not focusing attention on so many spots in the world. And this is one area of the world where, uh, where we will need to, to, to focus more attention. Uh, so that's my comment. And I, I, I think it, the comments that, that everybody has made so far indicate to me that that's what's been missing, is American leadership. And it's not just in this part of the world, but in so many other parts of the world. But it's really needed here. Well, thanks, Dick, for that comment. And being a former uh, U.S. diplomat, I agree with you that, you know, American leadership is something we need. And I hope whoever wins the, the election that we will uh, change course and, and lead not only in Europe, but around the world. So any other uh, questions from um, John? Susan? Uh, yes, John Conorton. Um, my question is really simple. Uh, I mean, I agree with, with Dick Howe. But I'm more interested in knowing how our, our guests from the Balkans uh, perceive American involvement. And, you know, I, my, my question is based on 40 years of involvement in the Northern Ireland peace process, where the United States was definitely welcomed and um, by most of the participants, not all, but ultimately everybody, I think, has recognized the role of the United States. So my question is very simple, as opposed to what I think, what do you think? Very good point, um, John. I think uh, as an American, I'll just speak for myself, but sometimes we think that everyone thinks in the same way that we do. And I think it's extremely important to hear from all of our friends and colleagues on you know, what you think. And maybe that's a good segue into our next round of policy recommendations. So. Um, we really would like, um, we'll start out with, uh, with Frank again, but we really would like to hear from you, not only for what you, you, all the countries of the region can do, but what are your recommendations for, you know, what uh, we can start out with the U.S., but U.S., European Union, and other countries need to do to try to move us forward in a positive direction. So we'll start out with Ambassador Wisner. Susan, thank you. Um, the conversation that we've had so far simply underscores in my mind what I have believed for many years, and that is this region, the Western Balkans, deserves attention. It's in our interest to give that attention. Its problems 
are serious and they impact directly on our collective, let me underscore the word collective future. Um, I, uh, I hope and my principal uh, point is that the United States and Europe need to find a way back to common policy ground. Unless we work together, we will be of little assistance to the parties <clears throat> of the region. Both of us have to accept the fact, however, that what happens in the Western Balkans is a work of long-term attention and commitment. Uh, change does not come quickly. Patience, resources, hard work, diplomacy are necessary. There are no quick fixes, but it does require attention and patience. So let me make four specific points. The first is, and we've heard it amply addressed so far, is the problem of Bosnia. And yes, I fully agree that the parties, the Bosnian, the elements of Bosnian society have got to figure this one out. However, I really believe the outside, the United States and Europe, have a role to play in encouraging, creating structures for discussion and resolution and incentives. Not that the decision lies outside, but the outside can provide the framework. And that leads me to the view that we simply can't sit around and wait for the old Dayton structure to fix itself. It needs to be repaired. But the main driver is to read, are the parties to Bosnia themselves helped by the outside. Second, Kosovo and Serbia, um, I'm of the view, and I hold it very strongly, that the chances of, um, of a mutual recognition between the two countries is inconceivable in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. I just don't imagine it as a realistic political outcome. What I do believe should be the intention of outside friends of Kosovo and Serbia is to work towards a live and let live formula for coexistence and cooperation mm -hmm. between the two parties without the trappings of formal uh, recognition. And that means first and foremost, focusing on the economy, on making uh, what Europe has negotiated, what was mentioned in Washington, uh, give it some real teeth, uh, roads, railroads, ports, Harbor, I mean, uh, uh, transport links, commercial interactions, investment, um, all of these things are what will really make a difference and will also address the issue of youth flight. The third uh, point that I would argue comes back to Europe mm -hmm. in particular, but to a lesser and to a degree to the United States. And that is a point each of you have made there is loss of confidence in a credible path to accession in Europe. And we argued in 2018, I'll argue again today, that that credible path to accession doesn't come cheaply or freely, but it is a careful stage strategy of steps taken in the region are rewarded with steps offered by the friends of the region, the mm -hmm. EU in particular, and the United mm -hmm. States, that there are early benefits from the association with Europe as early steps are taken to address the issues that mm -hmm. are needed to bring about long-term accession. Finally, <clears throat> it's my fourth point that, um, and I'm so glad President Tadic underscored it in referring to Moscow, I also, by indirection, uh, signal, I uh, have Turkey in my mind, and to a different degree, China. But the point I want to make is, whoever is the external audience, be it the Russians in particular, or anyone else, the Western Balkans' vocation is towards Europe and the transatlantic mm -hmm. community. And each nation that plays from the outside needs to accept that fact or 
that will affect our relationships with Moscow, Beijing, Ankara. The point is that we have to together, Europeans and Americans, make it clear that the future is with us and attempts to break that future will be uh, with, will have effect on our relationships with the other players. China is a bit different. Uh, in China's case, I continue to argue mm. that its actions in the short run will be principally economic. And here, I would encourage Europe to make it very clear in its dialogue with China that, <clears throat> um, that uh, the standards of behavior, Chinese investment behavior, need to be of the very highest quality in environment, in labor protection, so that China's investments in the Western Balkans operate at the same level of quality that they would if they were taking place in Europe. Last of all, let me hearken back to our own situation. Joe Biden knows this region very well. If he is uh, able to win the election. Uh, he will have an ear to it, but as Susan pointed out, his, his docket is going to be crowded. Um, so we as Americans are going to have to think of ways of intervening, of acting at below the presidential level with a blessing from a man who knows the region and cares about it, has visited, has followed its course and fate. And we could count on serious support from him if he is elected. Thank you, Susan. Well, thank you. Frank. Those are all really good ideas. And rather than me commenting, um, uh, I would like to um, move on to Evil, and uh, then maybe we can comment on each other's recommendations uh, at, at the end. Go ahead, Evil. So uh, finally, uh, I think that uh, United States and European Union should act in coordination. That's very important. Uh, especially because all uh, countries in Western Balkans declared uh, that they are willing to be a member of European Union, NATO not so uh, passionately, uh, but uh, most of them are willing to be members of NATO as well. Uh, uh, it must be very clear what are political requirements to be accepted. Uh, unfortunately, today we have a situation that uh, leaderships in many countries would like to be members of European Union, but they are not willing to fulfill requirements. I think the European Union must be very clear that it's not possible, that to be a member of European Union is necessary to accept uh, political, economical, and other requirements. And uh, uh, being a member of European Union, it's not a matter of mercy, but it's a matter of unity. So all countries must be capable to be full, fully cooperative members with uh, similar or the same uh, values as the other member of European Union. Uh, uh, I think that the cultural cooperation must be increased. I think uh, the, 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 the Europe, especially European Union, not so United States, should work uh, to build the European identity uh, not only in Western Balkans, but also in the other European countries, but also in, in Western Balkans, because uh, this identity is missing now. It's very important to feel as European as well. And of course, uh, uh, it, uh, some projects how to decline uh, nationalism. Nationalism is even more dangerous than corruption in Western Balkans. So how to how to uh, uh, decline uh, how to reject uh, nationalism and corruption, two of the most important obstacles for Western Balkans. Uh, so uh, that will be for me the most important issue, uh, firstly for the countries in Western Balkans and then of course for so-called mentors, the European Union and the United States. Well, thank you, Evo. And I think the last point is very, very uh, important and one that I hope others uh, think about and pick up on. But, you know, the, the danger or the issues uh, involving nationalism rather than looking for a European identity. And I think 
one of the successes, at least that I feel um, from my own country is that, you know, we, from our founding, tried to develop an American identity in uh, being a country of immigrants. And I think this is something that goes back to even what Zlatko said, is that when your president represents you, you represent everyone. And um, looking for this European identity, I think, is extremely uh, uh, an important point that you've brought up. So, Baris, we'll go to you next. Did you say that I have to make comments? Yeah, do you have any, what I'd yeah. like to yeah, know? Yes, I have. Your yes, I, I, yeah, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't hear well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my friend Ivo Josipovic have mentioned the two main problems uh, on the Western Balkans are nationalism and corruption. But I would like to add that this is also organized crime. The Western Balkan countries and the mafia from the Western Balkans is well connected with the mafia in South America. And we've been cooperating fully with the DIA and the SOCA from Great Britain on capturing tons and tons of cocaine during my term. But nowadays, the situation exploded. And uh, we are really facing with a very dangerous situation. And the organized crime can trigger more corruption and more nationalism in the region. And this is why I would like you to be more focused on, on, on that field, which is very important. Without real help, substantial help from the United States, we are not able to fight uh, the fully organized crime and to be very efficient in that respect. Finally, Finally, this is a global network. This is not our regional network. Uh, the, the regional criminals are cooperating extremely well. This is an irony, whether they uh, counterparts in other countries all around the world. They are not bringing cocaine or heroin uh, on our markets. They are bringing cocaine and heroin from elsewhere on European Union markets. And in that respect, that they are destabilizing European Union. This is very important to take this into, into the account. I think that we have to work very hard on reforming police system and intelligence system in our region. This is uh, something that can bring added value in the future and uh, also that kind of reforms are going to be very welcome from European Union. I'm expecting that. But uh, every, every kind of support and uh, uh, the assistance in that direction is uh, extremely, extremely important. Mm -hmm. And uh, finally, I agree and I disagree with the assessment that if uh, some countries that are not fulfilling all the preconditions to become member state of European Union has to be refused for full membership. Because uh, I, if I may say, uh, if I may uh, create kind of remarks regarding that, uh, Romania and Bulgaria didn't fulfill all obligations. But nowadays we can see that they are on a good path. Romania is doing very well in terms of economy. This is one of the most solid economy in the region with a substantial growth of GDP every year. They modernize the economy and Romania is doing very well right now in that direction. Uh, second, if uh, I can imagine uh, our regional countries to be member, member states of European Union nowadays. This is not that expensive for European Union. We are small markets, small countries. Uh, All together, we are approximately uh, 15 million people uh, that are not integrated uh, nowadays within European Union which means this is not that expensive. But with that kind of surveillance, if we are in a, in a full membership of European Union, instruments that European Union has is going to be much more efficient regarding reforms of our countries, solving traditional problems, chronic problems, tensions between nations, and something like that. And finally, without working very hard on integration process, European Union is not going to define themselves. The European Union is not going to define where borders of European Union, uh, which countries are not uh, uh, going to be member state of European Union. This is very important to know. I'm uh, uh, reminding ourselves that Turkey started to be integrated, uh, to be on European part many, many years ago, and uh, some leaders of European Union now, they 
have said that Turkey doesn't have a real perspective in European Union. But they have real concerns. If Turkey is not going to be member state of European Union in the next 10, 20 years, what is going to be outcome of that? Which kind of regime we are going to have in Istanbul? Which kind of political agenda we are going to have in Istanbul? And which kind of uh, ruling parties are going to lead Turkey in the future? Nowadays, we have Erdogan. Erdogan is not looking like Erdogan 10, 15 years ago. Erdogan is a different person. We have authoritarian regime in Turkey with a huge influence elsewhere. Turkey would like to be global power with a huge influence from Russia, from Siberia, where uh, are living uh, the ethnic groups that are speaking Turkophone's language until um, the Balkan region. And this is very important to take this into the consideration. Uh, maybe integration of such country within structure of European, maybe not full membership, but kind of structure of European Union can be very helpful regarding solving such potential risks in, in the future. This is my strategical assessment. Thank you. Well, I think you've actually raised really good points about uh, looking for, you know, the long term and the positive and not just looking at the specifics, um, but being flexible and that the positive impact that um, having a relationship with the European Union uh, can, can, um, can mean for the countries of uh, Southeastern Europe. But I also agree with you, what you mentioned about police reform and uh, fighting crime and uh, drug trafficking, those are international problems that we all can find common ground on, you know, to work together on. And I think sometimes when, when people don't disagree, when they disagree, um, if you can find an area where you can work together, that is the beginning of confidence building to look for other ways, um, you know, to come to consensus. So I give the floor now uh, to Zlatko. I think you're on mute. Well, now it's fine. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, by being mute, I, I was so enthusiastic about what you said, Susan, I mean, uh, and how you chair this today's gathering. And I'm really thankful for, 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 for your your energy, your passion, and your, your deep insight of what is happening here. Uh, you know, every time, like when Frank said, I'm not, I, I don't know so much about it, I knew that he knows much more than we do. So I really do appreciate foreigners who come and tell us how, how, how little they know about us, and then give us some suggestions. And they had them to be very, very good suggestions compared to people who say, I know everything, what you need, and then give us suggestions, see that's empty mostly. So I appreciate very much your in-depth analysis and your passion to, to be part of our solution. And I say I'm part of our solution. I just want to, when Ivo and myself, when we were meeting, he was president, just as he said, as president of the Republic of Croatia, he was really coming here in Bosnia to, to really try to open the process of reconciliation. But every time when I was meeting him in my capacity of uh, deputy prime minister, foreign minister, leader of, a, basically speaking, leader of the ruling coalition, and I was coming from certain ethnic group, and I never, never was tempted to say that I represent my group, which I belong to. I think it's very important. Like Evo was always representing overall Republic of Croatia interests, all citizens of Croatia. And that's what we have to do. I mean, if we want to, to come to the, some kind of solution, we have to be we the people. Now, having said so, when it comes to Bosnia, I think one very clear, clear suggestion. Uh, uh, Bosnia, if everything is region is beautiful, we are the best place to be. If everything is region going down to drain, get out of Bosnia. So, I mean, we are to a certain extent, uh, the, if the thing goes well, we are in the best part of the region. If the things go wrong, we are the worst parts of the region. Or maybe Western Balkan and Bosnia in particular is some kind of, uh, even for European Union and for Euro-Atlantic structures, I can call it the Western Balkan bus in particular is gate to peace and stability or gate to instability and conflict. So, of course, having said so, I'm very appreciate, I appreciate very much what Richard, especially said and John later on about the role of the United States of America, besides what uh, Frank and you, Susan, were saying. But you underlined that I'm very encouraged and, and I'm looking forward in our next events and our next gatherings along this line, I'm sure that we can come to something which is productive. Uh, we need American leadership. If I can put it this way, uh, yes, we in Bosnia, yes, we in Balkan, we are irreplaceable. 
we have to sort our problem. No one else will sort our problem. But European Union is needed. So European Union is needed for us who are irreplaceable to help us to get along with Europeanization in sense of standards and values that are actually values of the European Union. But the United States is indispensable without your leadership. I mean, needed and in irreplaceable parts are not going to sort out the problem. So I think that it's very important that we underline again, and I think that uh, United States of America leadership is absolutely preconditioned for stability of this part of the world, including not my country, but Western Balkan and European Union in long term. Uh, having said so, I think, and I, uh, I want to say that uh, when I say, uh, Richard, why I think you, are, uh, you pointed out the good point about American leadership and mentioning Richard Holbrook, the great person, the guy who really uh, did uh, leave a big footprint in here. And uh, you see the leaders that Holbrook was dealing with, they were leaders who at that historical circumstances, they had a support of their people why, how they managed it, but they had legitimacy. Today, Western Balkan leaders are completely without legitimacy in sense of uh, how much they are rooted in their constituencies. I'll give you an example from the latest International Republican Institute survey that was done in the region, talking about a lot of things, but one of the things when they were asking, give me top five politicians, give me one politician who you trust the most, top five in Serbia, together had 39%. Top five in Montenegro had 33%. Top five in Northern Macedonia had 21%. So top five people, can you imagine? In Bosnia and Herzegovina, top five people, Trovic, Komšić, Dodik, and Izabegovic, together with one guy from opposition. Five of them together had, believe it or not, 16%. 16% of people trust to five of them when you add all the individual sums. So there is complete disconnection in between a leader's influence and trust in the leaders in the region. That's why I think that international community can do much more. And after all, Boris, we all saw how Vucic is sitting in front of American president. Never was any president of the country, weaker country from the region setting like that. I mean, this type of protocol setting and everything. So, I mean, when Trump called Vucic, suddenly he became nice. What I'm trying to say, everyone from region is going to be much nicer when they see American leadership than our predecessors, even when we were in office, we were much tougher, so to speak, than the current guys. If they are pressed from the right perspective, with the right set of values, with principal goals of having us been sharing one Euro-Atlantic family and maybe even beyond. Zlatko, that's a very, very, um, you know, very, very good points that you've made to kind of round out our discussion. Does anyone have any comments on what your colleagues have said or for our observers? Can I say something? Sure, please, Boris, go ahead. That would be very important to have uh, American leadership in the region, but not all kind of American leadership, all kind of influences. I mean, I, I'm expecting more soft power in the future that is coming from the United States, more flexible and more um, intelligent uh, foreign policy and approach to the issues of the Western Balkans. Sometimes my friends from the United have States have made uh, big mistakes, and we are even today suffering because of that. And my suggestion is to take into the consideration our regional approach into analysis before United States are going to create new leadership in the region. We'll see what is going to be the outcome of uh, presidential elections. And I hope that my friend Joe Biden, if he's going to win, is going to take into consideration what I'm saying right now. Well, Boris, I would uh, agree with you uh, very much in that, you know, we have to look at, this goes back to what one or several of you have said, you know, not just look at, um, we do as an American and having worked for the US government, we do want to look at what's important for the U.S., but we need to look at, we, I would agree, we've made mistakes and we need to look at what you all feel is best for your region. I see that Richard Powell had his hand up. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say that, that um, we need somebody like Richard Holbrook, somebody who has a disinterested view, who comes there as an outside expert 
who's not trying to advance any personal interests and wants to simply bring people together. And I, we, I think a lot of people have lost, a lot of people in the US have lost confidence in our ability to do this. But I do believe that Biden is one of the few people who, who actually comes from this establishment, this foreign policy establishment. And he has a lot of experience in this. He does know this area. It, it, it will not happen quickly, but he, it will happen, I believe, if Biden is elected, that this area will come back into attention. Biden will appoint people around the world in different parts of, of the world, including this area. Uh, he'll be, have more attention to the Far East, uh, more attention to the Russian situation in Ukraine, uh, areas that have been hot spots. And it, it will take a little time, but there will be more American leadership around the world. And so I'm not saying that you should rest assured about this, but I do believe that we will see a restoration of American foreign policy leadership. And there'll be a lot of younger people who will get involved in this. And that will be a good thing because it's younger people who need to who need to do this. So I hope that happens. Well, thanks, Dick. Any other comments from our um, participants or um, our observers? Sure, Evo, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, even myself, uh, everyone is speaking about European and American leadership, how to have powers to help, to motivate, to change uh, Western Balkans, not only Western Balkans, uh, Vladko is right, Croatia was yesterday in th this club, so I really feel as a part of this club. But uh, isn't it shame that uh, countries need foreign leadership to decide something that's so obvious, that good future is in European Union and NATO. So uh, I felt during the Dayton negotiations, I felt ashamed that my president need this type, uh, not only my, the other presidents, need this type of leadership. They're not clever enough, not honest enough to have, uh, to have their own decision to, to cancel the war and to start a new era. So it's, uh, from one side, it's very nice to have support from European Union and United States but it's pity that there are no leadership, internal leadership, local leadership capable to reach these goals. Well, I think, you know, that's uh, something that everyone has agreed about. And I would go back to something that Frank said, is that um, what we as Americans or Europeans or whoever is involved is we need to just provide the structure for you to, um, you know, to step up and provide the leadership and the political will to resolve your own problems. Um, one thing that um, you ask, you know, why, or maybe why am I interested? Why am I involved? Well, you know, I was a U.S. diplomat for almost 30 years and early in my career, I worked for Warren Christopher. So I was in Dayton. I wasn't in the meetings, but I was there making sure everybody got the briefing materials. So I saw how Richard Holbrook worked and I saw, you know, the importance of the discussion. And again, we didn't make the decisions. It was the leaders of the countries who made the decisions. And I also <laughs> accompanied Warren Christopher the first time he went to Sarajevo uh, when it was safe enough after the war. I was there when he walked around the market and um, so I feel a, and I visited Zagreb and uh, I visited Kosovo. Uh, I haven't been to Belgrade, but I plan uh, to go there. I've met with lots of, of uh, Serbs and have Serb friends. So I think one of the things that the three organizations who have brought you together, one of the things I'm enjoying about not being part of the US government is that we can make decisions among ourselves and bring people like you together and uh, take people like uh, Frank Wisner to look at how we can try to influence what all our governments do. And I think um, we're especially at a critical point. You know, we haven't talked a lot about the devastation of the pandemic, but that has affected all of us. And uh, I've been disappointed that my own country hasn't shown more leadership in the world in trying to, you know, face this challenge that we all. Uh, uh, are encountering even as we speak today. So I think we've used up all of our time. And what I would just promise to all of you is that um, we are going to, we'd like to see a continuing discussion. 
we will uh, put together uh, a report of today's uh, discussion and that what we hope is that maybe we can take some of these recommendations and have a series of discussions. This is something that Zlatko, Rafshan and I have talked about and um, look at perhaps not, this was an overview of where you all think uh, the region is, but then we break down different uh, discussions, different topics that we've covered today and focus directly on those, whether it be um, how do we fight organized crime, you know, how do we uh, bring uh, leadership together to represent all the people, how do we fight corruption and nationalism. Uh, I think uh, they're all fantastic suggestions that you've given us uh, today. So um, I wanna thank all of you for, um, for taking the time to share your insights with us. I also wanna thank Rav Sean, because this, um, as I told you, he's the brains behind the organization. This was his idea, and I really appreciated uh, over the past year being involved with um, with NGIC. And um, I can't take full credit for that because one of my predecessors, um, George Schwab, got us uh, connected to NGIC, and I know that we will continue our very strong relationship. So thanks again to all of you, and I look forward to future uh, discussions and conversations. Thank you, Susan. Thank you.